Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Hear ye the word of the Lord. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, by birth, called the uncircumcision by those called, who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. But upon the foundation of the apostles, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. God's word for God's people and God's people said amen. amen. Uh, for a little bit of time, we are going to talk about no longer strangers. No longer strangers. I love technology. Technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, I don't mind spending money on gadgets just because I like the technology of it. People ask back in the day, you know, was it about uh, Blackberry or iPhone, and my answer was yes. Mac or PC, my answer is yes. Uh, I would spend money. I like technology. I liked how gadgets worked. When I was probably about nine or ten, when my mom wasn't home, I'd open up the TV because I'd like to look at the circuits. That kind of thing interested me, and I knew I was okay because I could put it back together and it still work. Uh, I spent a lot of time, my favorite class in high school was electronics because we would build circuits in electronics class. I liked technology, I liked how it worked and it got to a point when I was in the electronics class that I actually didn't get to go to class anymore. Uh, I would go to class but uh, I had gotten so far ahead on the coursework and the circuits and building all that that I would go into class, check in for attendance, and then I would go down to the auto shop and the young men and women who wanted car radios installed in their cars would come see me and I would put sound systems in their cars. I, I love technology. Uh, and I love that technology is advancing. I was going, I was on my way to an audio engineer conference in Tennessee not too long ago, and I was amazed at the fact that technology had advanced so far that I had to decide whether or not I really needed to bring my laptop. Because everything I could do on my laptop, I could do on my phone. So I didn't have to bring it. Speed, communication, information, everything's getting faster and faster but it does have its drawbacks. Because we can find whatever we want by punching some letters into a keyboard, it tends to keep us from actually interacting with some of the people around us. Uh, 
today the alienation, so to speak, or this being strangers, uh, can be caused by too much reliance on technology. Uh, there was a professor by the name of Sherry Turkle at MIT that believes that social media has isolated us and can cause us a lot of harm. She wrote a book called Alone Together, Why We Expect More From Technology and Less From Each Other. And she talks about how we have so many different ways to communicate, uh, you know, texts, email, instant message, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, phone calls, Skype. And that light speed communication is good for making connections to people. If I'm on the other side of the world and I need to talk, it's wonderful to have Skype so we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. But unfortunately, as we get bombarded by these messages, uh, and hurried response, sometimes the content of your conversation can be dumbed down. Conversation with depth and meaning and the kind of thing that we as people need to be able to interact with each other and take facial cues and learn social graces and different things, that gets lost. Because we're linked by technology, but we still are estranged or alienated in that same way. And it's a community outside of the community because uh, technology has given us access to people who are just like us. You know, if you like anything that you can possibly think of, because the, the internet has brought this seven billion people closer together, you might be able to find somebody all the way on the other side of the world that likes what you like. If you like to eat peanut butter and pickles, I'm pretty sure there's a group of people that like to do that and you'll find them. You may not find it, but you won't find anybody in your own neighborhood that way. And this reliance on technology has not only, in some instances, cut us off from <laughs> the people around us, but sometimes we use this technology and it's cut us off from God alone, cut off, isolated, even if we're in a bustling city like Galveston, with all the people coming in and out for tourism and all the people who are born on the island, we can still be cut off. And that is how the people at the Church of Ephesus, the Ephesians, were feeling almost 2,000 years before the invention of the internet. But fortunately, their lives were transformed by the gift of Jesus, who became their God, their neighbor, their connector. Paul tells them in the text that their alienation is over. For now, Christ Jesus, who you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Through the death of Jesus, we are restored and given to our neighbors, and, and, and we're stored with relationships, rather, with God and our neighbors. I keep saying that Ephesians has a special place in my heart. Uh, all, all the books have a special place. Um, but Ephesians, because those was one of those reasons that if, uh, if it wasn't for a situation like Ephesians, we wouldn't be here today. Because at first, it was all about being born into this thing, this way. It was about being born into this right relationship. And if you were not born into it, you didn't have access. But then came along the Gentiles, then came along uh, Jesus telling Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And, and the people that they thought were unclean were now brought into community. But that was kind of hard to do. You know how some churches can be about new members, not this church, but some churches uh, can be about new members. This is my church, and I like it the way it is. I don't want any new people. And so here we have these Gentiles here with people who were born into the church, and they, they were kind of alienated at first, and then they had to come together. And in the coming together, they had to work out their differences. But through Jesus, 
the Gentile people, those who were not born into the faith, those who were not circumcised, had an opportunity to get a different kind of circumcision. You know, I've been learning a lot about that circumcision, and it's, it has its benefits. Uh, at one time, uh, circumcision was given to all of the male children, the male Hebrew children, on the eighth day. Eighth being a, a number of new beginnings. The Bible says that God created the earth in seven, day, seven days, and so a lot of times when you see something with eight in it, particularly when it's dealing with Christ, that, that represents new beginnings. If you ever look at a lot of baptismal fonts, they will have eight sides. That's why. This circumcision was an indication, not just to say, oh, this is a Hebrew child, but it was an indication of God's promises. It's letting us know what the covenant was. It was almost like a branding or a seal. And it wasn't about the person. It was more about the relationship with God and a reminder of his promises, indicating whose we were. And so to say that these Gentiles were uncircumcised was to say they weren't a part of the family. They were strangers. They were outsiders. We were outsiders. But we were bought by his blood and now a part of the commonwealth big old fancy way to say of an organization that shared interests. We are products of his grace. The part before you're reading in verse 10 actually tells us that we have been created in Christ to do good works. And not only were we created in Christ to do good works, this was planned before the formation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, there was a plan put in place that if you so wanted to accept, you could have this wonderful gift. And so we are products of his grace. All we have to do is accept it. And not only are we products of his grace, we are partners of Israel. Christ is our peacemaker and our wall breaker. He's a reconciler. He has destroyed the barrier separating Jews from Gentiles. And then he's joined them into one body, a new person. Both Jews and Gentiles, hostility between these different groups can lead to separation. But we can identify ourselves primarily by who we are in Christ and who we are in the body of Christ. And those separations decrease. We have a cross here. It's a, a symbol of connectedness. One of the best examples I've seen about the cross when it talks about what we do not only in the sacrifice that uh, Jesus made for us, but it's also a, 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 an illustration of, of uh, relationships. See, uh, the, the, the vertical part represents our relationship with God. And then the horizontal part represents our relationship with people. When they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, he gave them two. To love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind. And then the second one was just like it. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. Or simply put as uh, Israel Houghton puts it, Love God, love people. And I understand that's kind of hard to do when you look at the current times. It seems that everybody out there doesn't necessarily want our love. Nor do they want to be loved at all. There is still separation going on behind the color of our skin. We as a people will be all too familiar with separation. Uh, voting rights, gentrification, separating schools. We might know just a little bit about separation. But if we get our relationship right with God, I think the relationship with people will fall into place. Inequalities can be overcome through the power of Jesus. He's the great equalizer. The, the common denomination, Jesus overcomes inequality and separation 
And because of Jesus, we can no longer be strangers, but a part of the family. Uh, I, I noticed in the text it mentions peace a lot. And uh, a lot of scholars have talked about the peace thing because of the political climate that was going on when this letter was being written. Uh, the Roman Empire at the time was establishing their own peace and trying to maintain it. They called it Pax Romana. And uh, when you read the history, uh, historical scholars about this Pax Romana, uh, they consider it a miracle by the scholars because there had never been so long a time where Rome or the Roman Empire was at peace. Uh, the Romans have been at war with somebody in some shape or form for the last 200 years. So peace to them was really just a, a break between wars. Or in most cases, they had beaten down their opponents so bad that they didn't want to fight anymore. So Augustus and all of his successors who came after him used propaganda to keep peace in the Roman people's mind because that benefited them more than war. Yes, they could take over a country, uh, area, and take what their resources and all of that and make money, but it, at a point in time, the fighting just began to cost more than they got. And we can get like that sometimes. Just want to fight. Fight to be fighting. Not understanding that the fighting is doing more harm than good. It'll be awesome to win and be in charge of something, but if you win and you fought everybody off, but now you're in charge of something just by yourself. I heard a marriage counselor once say, uh, it, 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 do you want to be right or do you want to be married? Every argument is not supposed to be pressed. But yet they had this peace going on and the, the, the Roman emperors were pressing peace and they used propaganda to keep the peace in their minds. Uh, uh, they held ceremonies celebrating peace. Uh, they put Pax Romana, which is the, the word for peace, on the money. So anytime you had to spend money, you were looking at the word peace. They distributed literature and pamphlets on it talking about the benefits of peace. Now, if they could do all that, talking about peace, how much more peace can we have getting the peace that passes all understanding? They, 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 they put peace on their finances, but how much more peace could we have if we put God on our finances? Uh, uh, how much more peace could we have if we continue to get familiar with literature about peace. So if they could do it, we could do it. How much more peace will we have over a man-made peace? I'm so glad to have a relationship with the one who doesn't make peace, but who is peace. We are, because of this, the people of God. We are, we are citizens and saints and citizens with the saints rather and members of the household of God. And I like that they used in the verse 19 it says, uh, so then you are no longer strangers. It says in some translations you have access. Access was important back then. Uh, some of the scholars even argue depending on whose family you were a part of it made better, better sense and benefits. Uh, you could be a servant in a powerful household. And being a servant in a powerful household gave you more access and ranking in some situations than a free person in a lower household. That access meant something. And so when I think about that, I think about us being a part of the best, most powerful family there is known to humankind. Being with Jesus. Can't get no powerful than that. We are the people of God and having access to the heavenly fathers, the, the creator of the world, the king of kings and the lord of lords. 
that's better than anything else that can be out there. Any president, any king, any country, anything. Access. We're no longer strangers. And not only are we the people of God, but we are the pillars of the temple. Uh, it is a foundation that is built on the apostles and the prophets. Those who came before us. Those who wrote down what God said and what we are supposed to do. It's a foundation. I have yet to see a house be, be built without a foundation last. I don't know. I mean, I'm not that much in the building, but I've yet to see one. If anyone knows of one, let me know. I, I would love to see that. That foundation keeps them stable. And then we have the cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus himself. See, that cornerstone is important. It's an important stone in the building. The first thing I do when I go to a new building, one of the first things I did when I got here is I went to see where the cornerstone was. Because you don't just put the cornerstone in. You have a ceremony. And not only do you have a ceremony to lay a cornerstone, but you put some important stuff in it. Something that tells you who this building is and who the people are in this building. It's cornerstone. It's documents that let us know who we are and whose we are. And in a, in a world where generations and where generous gifts can be taken away and where technology is used to scam people from us, there's one thing that we can be certain of. That Christ, the chief cornerstone, died for our sins and whosoever believes in him can be saved. There's something that we can be certain of no matter what kind of stranger we may be in a foreign land, we have a friend in Jesus. There's something we can be certain of that we are a part of the household of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He died for us and he rose again with all power in his hand that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In the name of the Father and in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come.